All right. Just everyone take a look at the disclaimer one more time. All right. Oops. You can share your screen. Let me share my screen here. <clears throat> and let's take a look at our single leg dashboard report. We've covered it a couple times, but we'll take a look at it again. Um, let me close this to expand the page. And on this page, what we're doing is looking at the options trades and then taking the single leg trades, a call or a put um, option that doesn't have a multi-leg or contingent trade attached to it. So these, these trades themselves are a result of a single leg uh, order. Okay. And you could see here that there were 7.4 million contracts that traded that were single leg out of a total of 9.2 million. Um, and then what we do is take those trades and we analyze them from different perspectives to get some insights. How traders were utilizing uh, option contracts, single leg option contracts. Um, and then we look at it from a couple different perspectives. So let's just take a look at it here. Uh, there were 60% of those trades were calls, 40% puts. Then we look at the interpretation. How were those orders um, coming in from the end users? So, you know, were the end users trying to take liquidity? more or were they providing liquid uh providing liquidity and which which direction were they going in were were they more trying to take it from the buy side or hit it from the sell side okay so from our interpretation um 48 percent of the incoming orders look like bought from coming in from the buy side 51 percent of them look like they were coming in from the sell side. Okay, so so pretty much even, um, oh, you know, buys versus sells. Then over here, we have the most active options. Um, these are single leg options. These are the most active, uh, the five top ones with the total volume and the VWAP price. So these would exclude any type of uh, spreads or contingent trades involved in that in this option. So you could see here the June twenty first one thirty call. That was th this is from Friday, so this would have been Friday's expiring option. Traded four hundred four thousand three hundred sixty five contracts, and for a VWAP price of fifty eight cents. And this is a hyperlink. So if we click on it, it will take us to the options chain. And then we could analyze this further, look at the time in sales, you know, look at how it traded throughout the day and so forth. But um, this just gives us a quick idea. What are the most popular traded options as far as single leg, sing, single leg options transactions? And here, if we just kind of, scan with our eyes and want to look for a pattern we could see here all of them were the zero dt those were the options that expired the same day june 21st um and then we could kind of tell that it was a mix calls puts and they all look like uh let me see i'm just eyeballing it here but probably around that at the money at the time of the trades it looks like you know if we just look at the strike ranges from 125 between 125 and 130 that looks like where the same range the stock traded in okay um then moving on we have another analysis and we convert that volume so we could take this all this volume and then 
we could convert that volume based on its Greeks, you know, the delta, the gamma, the vega, theta, to get an idea um, if there's a big lean one way or the other, the way the order flow was coming in. Again, this is an interpretation based on the rules that we set. Um, so here on balance, the way we interpreted that there were a negative three million deltas on balance traded in NVIDIA. In other words, if we if if we looked at, you know, buy incoming buying puts would be negative delta, you know, incoming selling calls would be a negative delta, incoming buying calls would be positive, and so forth. So if we took it on balance, it looks like there was a negative three million deltas um coming in from options. Um what about the gamma? So the gamma looks like negative eight million. And what that suggests is that there's more selling of options than buying that have a bigger gain. So the options that are expiring, the, the options with that expire closer to expiration have a bigger gamma. Okay, they always have a bigger gamma because right right up at expiration, they they go to you know parity, right? So right at the closer you are to expiration, the closer you are, the the bigger your gamma is in the options, especially like the at the monies or around the at the monies. And this would make sense from what we're seeing because the top five options were all expiring the same day. So these would have a really big gamma, especially once we're once they're around at the money. And it looks like probably more selling of those options than buying. So on balance, we see a negative uh, 8 million gamma. All right. What about the Vega? So the Vega comes, it's, it's the option sensitivity to implied volatility. And the further you go out, the larger your Vega. Because... Think of it when when an option expires, it has no implied volatility, right? The, it, it'll be paired. There's no more sensitivity to implied vol because it's either worthless or it's worth whatever it, whatever its intrinsic value is. But the further you go out, the more time premium you have, and the further you go out, the more sensitive an option is to a change in implied volatility. It will just have a bigger vega. Um, so the Vega could kind of tell us on balance if there's not only, so the gamma is showing us there is more selling of options relative to, to gamma, but that could all be on the short end of the, of, of the term structure. The Vega kind of tells us on balance how the implied volatility, right, where are people on balance selling more implied vol or vega. And this shows us that there's a negative 114,000 uh, uh, selling a vega, okay, negative 114,000. Um, and then th we have the theta. So whatever, you know, it would be, if you have negative gamma, you'll have a positive theta, positive gamma, you'll have a negative theta. Right, so positive gamma means your your net long long options, and if your net long options you have decay, that would be negative theta. If your net short options you have a positive decay, or right? your time decay is working for you, so you'd have a positive theta. Okay. So let's move on then to the conditions. Okay, there. The, when when we enter in single leg orders, how are these orders executed? Okay, so these these are telling us um, 
the way that the, the, the distribution of how these orders were executed. So 70% of them were auto executed. So they were executed electronically by the exchanges um, matching engine, um, you know, meaning buyer and seller were were matched up, were were just matched up uh, at at a whatever price. Then we have twenty two percent were uh, hit the price improvement auction. So the price improvement auction and most exchanges have it works the following when you enter in an order let's say an end user enters in an order to to buy or sell an option and and it's it could be marketable right so let's say that the option is a dollar bid a dollar bid dollar 10 offer and you enter an order I'll buy it at a dollar 10 right where whatever price you see you'll buy it at a dollar 10 well the exchange can before it gets executed, could flash that order, let's say for one second, to its market makers and specialists. And what it does is, is it asks, would anybody, we have an order to buy for 110, is anybody willing to give it a better price, like 109 or 108? So it creates a competition really quickly between market makers that are maybe willing to sell that option to you at a better, giving you a better price. And that would be the price improvement auction, right? So sometimes you may enter in a trade and you say, well, oh, I try to buy for $1.10 and wow, I got it for, I got filled at $1.07. So you saved three cents. Well, that could have been because it entered a price improvement auction and there was a, market maker or an order there that's hidden, not visible, but willing to to uh, negotiate at a better price. So 22% of those trades hit the price improvement auction, which tells us that there's there's good liquidity there. And, you know, there's a good ch chance that maybe even if you place your order in between the markets or, you know, a little bit, you know, below or above the markets, that you may be able to get a price improvement, right? So this shows us that there's there's some good liquidity there, and market maker specialists are willing to even you know squeeze in their prices inside what is displayed. And then we got the intermarket sweeps. That's eight percent, and these would be the more aggressive orders. So when you when you have a person who wants to get an immediate fill on an order and and they don't want to go from from one exchange to the next exchange to the next exchange they just want to be able to get their entire fill they they could enter in an intermarket sweep order and what it's saying is go and take the top of book on each of these exchanges even if I have to go and pay a higher price, let's say, than a different displayed exchange, I want to make sure I hit all those exchanges simultaneously because if I don't and the stock moves, I'll end up having to pay higher anyway. So that's an intermarket sweep order. It would be more aggressive. You'd have to designate your, your order as an intermarket sweep order. And 8% of the trades hit that intermarket sweep. And then 1% of the trades happen on the floor. And what this is saying is that instead of entering your order electronically, this order was handled um, with a physical touch. There was, there was a broker, somebody called a broker on the phone. The broker tried to negotiate perhaps with another um, market maker or, or specialist, went and shopped around the order and the reason for that is that sometimes you could have an order that is very large. And if it's very large, maybe beyond what the liquidity is displayed, 
then the broker to get it filled all in one, at, at one price will try to go to market makers, go to a specialist, maybe go to other traders and ask them if if they're willing to trade at this price. And, you know, maybe you get like five market makers all willing to say, you know, I'll sell 100, sell 100, sell 100, and then you got your 500. And sometimes you'll need a floor trader, floor broker to do that. Another reason is maybe you're trying to get a better price, you know, and you're trying to figure out by talking with people, you know, well, are you willing to, you know, go down in price if I come up in price or are you willing to meet me halfway or somewhere along that? So that that happens where you need human touch, right? Where the you're trying to negotiate either for for volume or price and you need some some human touch and relationships to try to get that execution. So 1% of those trades in NVIDIA were four trades. Okay. Um, then we got this other stat, and this is comparing the trade price versus the state of the market at the time of the trade. So you could see, you know, we got a trade and then we, and then we have this bid and offer at the time of the trade. The bid and the offer are just the displayed interest. That's where you know somebody's willing to buy some an option at a certain price. The offer ask ask is the price that somebody's willing to to sell it. And those are firm. That means once you display it, if somebody hits your bid, you're obligated to buy. If somebody hit takes out your ask, you're obligated to sell. So it's not something that is, you know, you're suggested you're it's firm. Once you, once you say you enter an order, I'm going to buy 10 contracts at a dollar. Well, if somebody, if somebody hits that bid, you bought it, right? It's not. And if you, and the same thing on the offer, once you put it out there, once you say, I'm willing to sell this option at $2. And if somebody takes it, that's it. You, you, you're obligated to trade it. So those bids and offers out there, they're firm. So if we compare where the trade happened versus the bid and offer, we could kind of get an idea of the liquidity and how things were executed. So here we see 27% of the trades happen on the bid, 29% on the ask, and 12% were not on the bid, but they were below the midpoint. So they were closer to the bid. 12% were, were above the mid, closer to the ask, but not the ask. Then the intermarket sweeps, we could see they could have caused trades that were below the bid or above the ask, 1%, and then right at the mid, 18%. And this gives us an idea how the trades are executed relative to those.